Good afternoon, everyone. This is Peyton. This is Production Materials and Chapter 6, Mechanical Properties. So issues to address in chapter, stress and strain, what are they and how are they used instead of load and deformation? Elastic behavior, when loads are small, how much deformation occurs and what materials get released? Plastic, at what point does permanent deformation occur? What materials are most resistant to permanent deformation? Finally, toughness and ductility, what are they and how do we measure them? So let's get started. Plastic deformation is um, deformation that is reversible or plastic meat reversible. So starting out with an initial sample here, it's a bar, certain length. This is cross section blown up showing atoms stacked on top of each other. Now if we extend the length of that bar by count delta, Pulling on it with a force F, the atoms, looking at them very close up, we start to see gaps between faces of the atoms in the longitudinal direction, and so the bonds are stretching. So if you look at the force versus uh, delta, or this amount here, we are in a linear elastic where force increases delta. Now, if we release the, the load on the bar again, it returns to its, its initial shape and brings between the atoms or those bonds, bounce back its back to where it was. So that's elastic deformation, which is reversible. Now on the other hand, there might be different types of materials, not all materials. You might have materials that are non-linear elastic. So rubber bands or certain stretchy materials have that behavior. So that is a nonlinear elastic. So try stretching a rubber band the next time you have one and see if you can get a sense of how that force changes with this. Now if you were to stretch the sample even further on the elastic deformation, you start to get what we call plastic deformation. Plastic deformation is permanent. So the sample starts out initially here at number one. We stretch the sample, and first the bonds start to stretch. And at some point, start getting planes shearing. And um, going back to what we learned about dislocations, that's what's occurring here. Location motion. Uh, and the total distance for delta is much greater. So uh, this behavior is very common in metals, by the way. Um, when we unload the sample, the plastic deformation remains Plastic deformation remains, but the um, elastic deformation uh, does not. It returns back to its original state. So that is what happens here when it's the force on it. So there's a new term here. It's called engineering stress. So engineering stress is Tensile stress, 
sigma, and it's equal to the force that's applied to a area perpendicular to it. So force is green, area a naught, and so a naught is not because it's called the original cross sectional before loading. So as you pull on it, a naught is actually going to be increasing. So this is the original. And the units for this are pounds per square inch or newton per squared. So those are the units for stress. And you may also have shear stress that this metal sample is going to experience if the force is not applied perpendicular to the cross-sectional area that we're looking at. So if the force is now black line F, you have a component that's tensile and you have a component that is shear, that's perpendicular to it. So shear stress is just F sub S over A naught. And the units for shear stress are Newton per meter squared or uh, pounds per inch squared. So the same as uh, so there are some <clears throat> common states of stress. There is a simple, uh, simple tension. This uh, is synonymous to a cable on a ski lift, for example where all of the stress launched to direction. And um, stress is just F over naught. Uh, also in the ski lift, you might have torsional stresses. And on that um, ax axial uh, shaft, uh, if you look at component here, everything is here. So have uh, shear stresses in plane and sorry. So this shear stress for torsion is just uh, F sub S over A naught. So that's torsional. Other types of stress states have simple compression, this is similar to tension, except now we are compressing the sample. Um, there are no shear stresses in this case either. So sigma is equal to F over A naught. There's some examples of simple compression on a bridge beam here and on this balancing rock in an arch park. Uh, another type of common stress state, we have biaxial tension. Um, this is actually a picture that I took while I was at the Oshkosh Air Show a couple of years back. And this A350 Airbus, a new aircraft that is almost all carbon fiber composite. So the, um, the stress in the skin of this airplane is um, called the biaxial tension. So um, the another type of stress is hydrostatic stress. And this picture that I took while feeding the ferocious koi at the uh, Kauai Marriott Resort. And they will literally out of the water to get the food. So these are not following the rules of hydrostatic Depression. They're probably experiencing a lot more in their bellies right now. All right. So, um, engineering strain is uh, another term that we're going to bring up. And this is uh, tensile strain, which is um, epsilon is equal to 
delta over L naught. So the that's the change in length over the original length. So we call that tensile strain. And strain is a dimensionless parameter here. You can see it could be in you know meters over meters. That's going to be dimensionless. Um, the lateral strain is the change dimension, change in the dimension in the lateral direction. So that's a negative delta sub L over the original width or W, W naught. Um, so we measure tensile stress, tensile strain apparatus like this. It has a load cell on the top and it has these giant screws which start to pull the sample apart like a pre-machined bar with threaded ends on it. Then there's an extensometer which is attached to it which measures increase in length sample. And here's a, a typical tensile specimen here. And it's important to have a consistent diameter across the length of the H. And uh, that way we can also calculate um, the A sub naught for the cross sectional area that the force is applied to. Um, there are linear elastic properties, another term to bring up. Um, and there's a material property called the modulus of elasticity, also called the Young's modulus. And this is, we also refer to this as stiffness, or the strength of the bonds between the atoms while it's, um, while it's being stretched elastic region. So this is the early stress before it starts to form. And in metals, this is typically linear. And so we can measure the slope of the stress versus strain to uh, calculate the elastic modulus. So elastic modulus is just stress divided by the strain um, from Hooke's law. Stress is equal to Young's modulus times uh, um, strain. So uh, this is a sample in simple tension. So uh, the elastic modulus is, as I said, proportional to bond strain metal. So the slope, a uh, steeper slope, is going to be higher elastic modulus. Remember, it's, it's the stress over the strain. So a higher change in stress over a smaller change in strain for the red line here. And the blue line is going to be more weakly bonded, uh, where you have less of a stress for a given strain of separation. <clears throat> so Looking at a variety of materials here for Young's modulus, units are gigapascals in this graph. Uh, metals are tend to be very high, and the ones here at the top, like tungsten, moly, have a very high melting temperature. And Magnesium and tin have a very low melting temperature. And so for metals, the Young's modulus is proportional to the melting temperature of the metal. So remember that material melts when the when the bonds vibrate so much that they start to break. And so that's the strength of the bonds, um, which is the Young's modulus. Um, so diamond here um, wins the Young's modulus race, 
and uh, and our polymers don't do a very good job of that. They have very low young modules. All right, so plastic is, as mentioned previously, permanent. Plastic is permanent deformation. And if we the sample at a temperature less than a third of the melting temperature, this is lower temperatures, and put it in a simple tension. See, there's no shear here, and we're stretching those those atomic bonds, and we can stretch and release the stretch the force on that indefinitely, and it's just going to keep bouncing back and forth and return. Back to the origin here, and we're going to say we're going to see no permanent uh, deformation. But if we start pulling the specimen harder, then we're going to reach a point where atom planes start to slip. So this is going to be occurring at larger stresses, like. The uh, earlier plot where it was forced, now we're looking at, at strain. So, but then if we release the specimen, leave all forces from it, we're still going to have some um, permanent or plastic uh, deformation after the load is removed. Notice here that the atoms are not stretched anymore. So they bounce back, but you still are left with the planes. That's the non-recoverable part. So the plastic strain on the sample is epsilon dot P or um, plastic strain. Now yield strength another term here, and this is the stress at which noticeable plastic deformation has occurred. So this is a material property. Uh, we can look up tables just like Young's modulus, look up tables for different materials with different yield strengths. And often we use a, um, a convention here with um, where we where the yield stress is measured at a 0 0.002 uh, percent offset or in engineering strain of 0 0.02. And that's normally that's needed because often it's very difficult to identify where um, the yielding has started because it's such a gradual transition between Linear elastic, plastic section. So, um, if we were to have a two inch sample, then um, that's like measuring the yield when the sample has been stretched by 0 0.04 inches. Okay, so that's the stress at which noticeable plastic. So just like Young's modulus, we can look at value for yield strength. And steels are all over the map with yield strength. Um, some of them low, like tin, and some are very high, like steel, uh, 4140 quenched, chromoly quenched tempered. That's what. Uh, it's even higher than very strong, very high yield for that one. Um, so polymers have the another term is tensile strength. So tensile strength is the maximum stress on the engineering stress strain curve um, before it starts to drop back down again. Now, 
you may wonder, why does it drop back down? And the reason why is because the specimen starts to connect. And as you remember, uh, stress is always calculated over original cross-sectional area. So in reality, what the sample is feeling at nectary is a much higher stress than what is plotted here. But since this engineering stress strain curve then able to pinpoint uh, maximum cell stress uh, for this. So if we continue stretching it, we're going to get to the point where there's fracture, and that's called the ultimate strength, another term from tensile. Ultimate strength, or at which point at which the uh, neck gets so thin and then the sample breaks. Uh, so for polymers, maximum tensile strength occurs when the polymer backbone chains are fully aligned or about to break. So as you know, this is, again, a third material property, um, elastic modulus, yield strength, and now tensile strength. Looking at different materials, metals and steel, very strong, the 4140 quenched and tempered, and uh, fiber, carbon fibers are very, very strong tension, and they're way up there, and uh, wood is the worst for, uh, for tensile stress. Another term that we need to know about materials and a material property is ductility. Now ductility is a measure of the plastic tensile strain at failure. So uh, it's uh, called percent elongation. So that's the final length minus the original length over the change in length at the point of fracture over the multiply that by one. So we have a sample here with a small ductility, then elongation, and one that has a large ductility or elongation. So just because it might have it might have a very high yield strain tensile strain ability. There's another ductility measurement that's synonymous to elongation, and that's RA, which is reduction area. So that's original area minus the final cross-sectional area over the original cross-sectional area. So in uh, a ductile sample, we'll have necking. More necking that occurs, smaller cross-sectional area at the point of fracture, and that will then have high ductility uh, value associated with it. Now, toughness is a great material property. Uh, because it takes into consideration both the, um, the ultimate strength, the tensile strength, and also the ductility. So um, an ideal sample will have both um, high, high tensile strength and high ductility. That is going to be something very tough. Um, that's what we mean by toughness. So it's the energy to break a volume of material. And um, it's approximated by the area under the stress strain curve. So the green graph has the largest of cross-sectional areas. And so that is going to have the largest toughness. Typically metals 
when went out on these toughness measurements. Uh, brittle, brittle materials uh, tend to have very small toughnesses, and polymers tend to have very small toughness. They may they might have great ductility, but the area under that stress strain curve is going to uh, be very small, so you'll have low toughness. <clears throat> now, um, another material property that is important, not as important, but we call this resilient. And it's the ability for a material to store energy. And um, the ability to store energy is just the, the area under this linear elastic stress strain curve. And my, my father worked for a company called Liquid Metal, and um, it used a very unique metal, and it was uh, uh, an amorphous metal. And it had the highest known resilience. And I think they also made like baseball bats out of this amorphous metal as well. Um, but I, I'd like to show you a short video of the um, on YouTube of how awesome this this uh, amorphous metal is with their resilience. Three tubes, three striking plates, a stainless steel surface, titanium, and our own liquid metal alloy. Three identical steel balls are dropped on the individual plates simultaneously. Liquid metal, a metallic glass, has a very high elastic strain limit and accompanying very high strength. To put it simply, the high strain limit makes liquid metal the world's premier spring material. It's the best material we could possibly come up with to store and retrieve elastic energy in a mechanical device. A material which can efficiently store energy and give it back again up to very high strain a material which can store a very high density of elastic energy becomes the premier material when that performance benchmark is critical. Any material which can efficiently store elastic energy up to very high densities is superior to other materials in that respect will be the premier material for those kinds of applications. So that's an example of a material with very high resilience. Moving on. Um, another material property is called hardness, and this is resistance to uh, plastically indenting the surface of the material. And uh, large hardnesses mean the it's the resistance to plastic deformation or cracking while in compression and better wear properties. So we have uh, equipment in the materials lab which allows us to measure hardness. There's different types of hardness testers depending on the um, types of surface, how hard they are, how soft they are. So we apply a known force and we measure the uh, size of the indent after it's removed. So going from soft materials to very hard surfaces, plastics, then alloy, then uh, brass alloys, and then easy machine steels like, like a, a 1020 steel. Then we have file hard steels, which are high in carbon concentration, cutting tools, nitride steels, and finally diamond, one of the hardest known materials.
Uh, finally, we're going to mention here the design for safety factors. Uh, there are design uncertainties, so there's also material uncertainties. So we don't want to we don't want to push the limit. So what we do is we incorporate in um, a design factor or a safety factor, um, n we call that, and uh, often it's uh, between 1.2 all the way up to 4. So um, there is an example here, calculate a diameter d to ensure that yield does not occur in a 1045 carbon steel rod and use a factor of safety of 5. So here's our 1040 plain carbon steel um, from the tables. We can look up, find that it has a yield strength of 310 megapascals and a tensile strength of 565 megapascals. Um, and uh, we are applying a force of 220,000 newtons. So we're plugging in a 5. And know that uh, our diameter sample is 0 0.067 or um, 6.7 centimeters. And that is using a design uh, factor of safety of 5. So in summary, uh, stress and strain these are the size independent measurements of load and displacement. So size independent means that we um, divide it by the cross-sectional area or the length. Elastic behavior. This is uh, the reversible behavior often shows a linear relation when stress and strain uh, are in it. Linear relation between stress and strain. And to minimize the deformation, we select a material with a very large elastic modulus, D e or G. So the plastic behavior, this is the permanent deformation that occurs when the tensile or compressive axial stresses reach the sigma sub y or the yield stress. The toughness is the energy needed to break a unit volume of material. This is the area under the stress strain curve. Very important measurement. And ductility is the uh, plastic strain at failure. Thank you, and that covers.